Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir, tout le monde. Welcome to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Bienvenue au Musée canadien pour les droits de la personne. Uh, I'm going to just give a few housekeeping remarks and we want to get started right into our program. But welcome first to our first event of our President's Lecture Series. I'm so pleased today to have award-winning author, journalist, and historian Michael Petro here tonight as our speaker. We're also thrilled to have Nafia Nasso uh, speaking a bit about her experience as a representative and a member of the Yazidi community. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview of the program for this evening. Uh, we're going to start with some opening remarks from Dr. John Young, and then we'll have a few words from Nafia, followed by our keynote speaker. We will then have an in-conversation with, with John Young and Michael, and then we've allowed plenty of time for questions from the audience. So we'll have a full evening, and I'll introduce everything as we go along, but uh, keep all your questions. Uh, we'll have a really good Q&A portion at the end. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to welcome the President and CEO of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, Dr. John Young, to the stage. Thank you, Angela, and bonsoir tout le monde. Um, first, I'm still relatively new to Winnipeg. I know there are here many here that uh, have lived here much longer than I, and I just want to highlight that uh, when I hear long-term Winnipeggers greet visitors from out of town, they're always apologizing for the weather. I, I get that that's something we feel we need to do tonight, but uh, I just take great pleasure that this is a full four-season city. So uh, thank you for those of you who have braved the elements to join us tonight. Let us begin first by acknowledging that we are on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. These lands are also known as the heartland of the Métis people. And I also want to acknowledge that the water we find in the museum is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. I'm very excited to be launching this uh, presidential lecture series. Um, central part of the museum's mandate is to promote respectful reflection and dialogue on human rights themes. And when we use the word dialogue, it's a deliberate choice. When we talk about difficult subjects, whether they lie in the past or in the present, there are always some challenges that are invited. People can hold different and sometimes competing interpretations of events. It's easy for a discussion to become a debate. And sometimes uh, people can be more interested in winning an argument than they are in ensuring that everyone is heard or taking the time to actively listen. Dialogue ensures that all voices can come to the table and share their experiences, indeed share their memories, share their perspectives without fear of being silenced. At times, this can invite painful conversations, but I believe they are necessary ones. This lecture series is designed to inspire this kind of dialogue and these kind of shared memories. Michael's personal experience throughout the Middle East and of the conflict in Iraq, his deep uh, research as a historian and as a journalist, particularly into the plight of the Yazidis, is why we invited him to be part of this conversation. And the museum is a place for many voices as many of you are aware, there is a large community of Yazidi refugees here in Winnipeg. More Yazidi refugees in Winnipeg than any other city in Canada except for London, Ontario. Um, so we're honored uh, to be able to have this conversation and we would not be able to do so without some of their voices. That's why we're very honored to invite uh, Nafia Naso to speak to you. Nafia was only two years old when her family fled their home in northern Iraq. At the time, her father and many other family members had been forcibly conscripted into the Iraqi military, but because of their religion, they were considered to, to be disposable. And when her father managed to escape, the family fled to Syria. In 1998, after waiting eight years in a United Nations refugee camp, Nafia's family learned that they had been accepted to Canada and arrived in Morden, Manitoba, sponsored by a Mennonite church in the community. 
Now, Nafia helps thousands of Yazidi refugees escape religious persecution and find safety in Canada. So without much further ado, I would like to invite Nafia Naso to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and good evening ladies and gentlemen. I am so pleased to be here with you tonight to have the chance to be part of such an important event. This evening we will hear, we will hear from award-winning author and journalist Michael Petro um, about the ISIS propaganda strategy and its role in the Yazidi genocide. I am thankful um, to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and to John Young for opening the 2018 President's Lecture Series with this important topic. In August of 2014, we saw ISIS sweep through Yazidi lands, murdering thousands of men, enslaving thousands of women and girls, selling them for as little as a pack of cigarettes and using young boys as suicide bomber, bombers and frontline soldiers when battling. When I think about my childhood, childhood and the hate my family and I experience, solely because of our religious beliefs, I can see how the seed of hate and the lack of education and misguided anger came together to lead us to those circumstances. Still, I could not believe what I was hearing on the news and from family and friends in Iraq when the campaign to eradicate the Yazidis began. We, the Yazidi community, were at a loss. How could we help? Who could we turn to for help? Who would help a people they knew nothing about? Thankfully, the Winnipeg Jewish community extended their hand, and I, am, I was amazed by the empathy and willingness to help, even though most people knew nothing about the Yazidis. We quickly mobilized and created Operation Ezra and began speaking at events, raising awareness um, and raising funds to hopefully begin to privately sponsor Yazidi families to Winnipeg. To date, we have welcomed eight Yazidi families and we are waiting for two more families to arrive um, over the next few weeks with the hope to sponsor many more families um, in the near future. In total, that numbers to 55 people we have brought into Canada since 2016. An important step to the success of Operation Ezra and the government-sponsored Yazidi program was educating on who the Yazidis are. This was instru instrumental sorry, in getting the federal government to start a government-sponsored Yazidi program. Events such as this are a powerful tool to help in educating people and in having a dialogue around human rights, mass atrocities, and the crime of genocide. What have we learned from history? How can we continue to allow such a crime to take place in the 21st century? How can we allow such a crime to happen in a broad daylight when we can no longer claim we did not know? The horror of this story is still unfolding as thousands of Yazidis remain displaced. Many children are still missing, and so many women and children are in need of psychological counseling. And again, I want to thank the museum again for their efforts in sharing the story of the Yazidi genocide with Canadians. Thank you. Thank you so much for using your voice um, to continue to amplify this message and educate all of us here, so thank you so much. Um, it's such an inspiration and it's so incredible that um, when you listen to a little bit about your experience, Nathia, that you can stand here today um, and be such a loud, loud and strong voice, so thank you so much. Can we just give her one more round of applause? <laughs> So I'd like to more formally introduce our keynote speaker uh, for this evening. 
His 2008 book, Renegades, Canadians in the Spanish Civil War, was described as the best, most complete count of Canadians in the Spanish Civil War we are ever likely to get. And the Spanish newspaper, El Pe, called it beautiful. Many people have come to know Michael's writing through his journalism. He has reported across the Middle East, Central Asia, Africa, and Europe and he has won three National Magazine Awards. In 2012, he published an account of his reporting experience entitled, Is This Your First War? Travels Through the Post-9-11 Islamic World. It won the Ottawa Book Award for nonfiction. Michael is now the 2018 Martin Wise Goodman Canadian Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and also a non-resident fellow at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. In 2014, he visited northern Iraq, where he spoke to a number of Yazidis in refugee camps in northern Iraq and heard their stories of enslavement and rape. Tonight, he will speak to us about the persecution of the Yazidis by ISIS and the role of propaganda in this genocide. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Petro. Thank you, Angela. And thank you, John. And thank you, Nathia. Uh, I am going to talk about the so-called Islamic State and the Yazidi genocide tonight, but I want to start somewhere else. Uh, I want to start in 1943. Jan Karski was uh, a young Polish officer. And in 1939, he was captured by the Red Army the Red Army invaded from the east and the German Army invaded from the west and divided Poland between the two. He was captured by the Soviets. He was able to conceal his full officer's rank and so escaped massacre at Katyn. The Soviets handed him over to the Germans and he escaped from the Germans as well. He joined the Polish underground and was smuggled twice into the Warsaw Ghetto and once into a transit camp uh, which was transporting Jews to the Belzac death camp. The Polish underground wanted to have an eyewitness report to what was happening. They wanted to have proof of the ongoing destruction of the European Jews. And Karski obtained this and he took it to the United States. And in 1943, he met with Felix Frankfurter, uh, a US Supreme Court justice, and explained what he had seen. And Frankfurter's response was, I cannot believe what you have told me. And the representatives of the Polish government in exile, they got very upset and they said, this man is speaking with the full authority of the Polish government. You cannot say that he is lying. And Frankfurter said, I'm not saying he's lying. I'm saying I can't believe what he's told me. And I think that that struggle, what Nafia talked about, she, the struggle to believe the horrors that seem beyond the scope of what we previously accepted as possible is something that is natural. It's something that I've seen on both sides, both the, the reluctance to accept that or the presumed reluctance to accept that, and then also the desire to impart the, the, the truth or the proof. In 2014, I was in northern Iraq. I was in a town south of Kirkuk, so far from the Yazidi heartland of Sinjar, and this was a town that had been fought over by Kurdish Peshmerga forces, by Iranian-backed Shia militia, and had recently been cleared out uh, of Islamic State. And the whole, the town had been bombed, and there was this uneasy tension between the Shia militias and the Kurds. And there was this, a, a smell of death everywhere and a lot of rubble, and the Arab inhabitants of the town had fled. And the commander told me that, because this is just from the, the, the reports, this is, a, this is October, reports had come out uh, about the enslavement of the Yazidis, about this mass murder that had taken place that summer, but there was still a reluctance to accept it, and the commander said, no, I have, 
I have this proof, and he forced me to, not forced, it wasn't traumatic to look, about, look at it or anything, but it was very important for him to see it was on his cell phone, which were these photographs of, of clothing uh, very specific to Yazidi women. So this was proof that Yazidi women had been trafficked uh, from uh, Sinjar, uh, far south of Kirkuk, this, this, uh, this selling, this, this selling of, of, of human, as if they were cargo, as if they were chattel, was happening in 2014. And I don't think that's much different than during the same reporting trip uh, in northern Iraq, near Sinjar, but further west, a lot of the Kurds from Kobani in Syria had uh, escaped through Turkey and were coming into northern Iraq. And so many of them were traumatized, but it was still important for them to make me see these photographs of uh, the beheaded bodies of their relatives. They wanted, to, uh, they wanted to prove that what seemed unfathomable had in fact happened. And in a lot of ways, I think this is what is the case with the Yazidi genocide. There is, there was a reluctance to accept that in 2014, uh, this sort of mass enslavement, this yet again attempt to eradicate a people uh, would take place. But it did take place, it is taking place. These are the facts that we know, we know to be true. In 2014, the so-called Islamic State took over the Yazidi heartland in and around the town of Sinjar and Mount Sinjar. Uh, men who were not immediately murdered, uh, were given, and many were, were given the choice of uh, converting to Islam or death. Uh, young children who were not immediately killed, and many were, were given the, well, they weren't given the choice. They were uh, either forcibly adopted into uh, Sunni Muslim families or into these training camps for the Islamic State. Uh, women and girls who were not immediately killed, and many were, were forcibly uh, enslaved as sex slaves or as, I mean, I think it's a perversion of the term to use the word wife, but as forcibly married or enslaved to Islamic State uh, fighters. Uh, survivors of the initial wave of, the, wave of attack uh, fled up the slopes of Mount Sinjar, where many died of exposure. And I interviewed some of the survivors from this flight in the Dohuk refugee camp. And they described, they described fleeing up the mountain and looking back and seeing their, seeing their Sunni Muslim neighbors looting their homes. They described not having water and, and two teenage boys going back into the town, back into their village to try to salvage food or water or perhaps uh, other goods and not returning. And their father uh, later on going down to, to look for them and finding their uh, headless bodies. This has been declared a genocide, of course, by the Canadian Parliament, by the United Nations, by the U.S. Holocaust Museum. And what I want to talk about now is how did it happen? And it's not, there's, no, there's not a, an easy answer. There's not a singular answer either. Um, Nafia talked about the discrimination that her family had suffered simply because of their religion. And of course, that's true. It's been happening for decades. It's been happening for longer than that. Hundreds of Yazidis died in a 2007 truck bombing attack, but this was still something new. And I think as we try to unpack how this happened, one of the threads we need to pull out is Islamic State's skill with media, with their public messaging, with their public narrative. And there's a precedent for this. If we look, for example, at Europe prior to the Second World War, and the historian Timothy Snyder is has written about this, Germany wasn't an obvious candidate to be the incubator of genocide. It's hard to quantify anti-Semitism, but if you look at integration through marriage, for example, uh, Germany wasn't the, the leading candidate for this, this to unfold. We might look 
We might look at Poland, we might look at Russia. Um, and yet it was Germany where it, where it happened, where, it was, where that germ, that seed grew. And I think one of the reasons we have to look at is uh, the propaganda, the success of, of, of Hitler as, as shaping that narrative, the success of Goebbels, just the, the Nazi propaganda efforts to dehumanize the Jews, to prepare the ground for that genocide, to cultivate an acceptance of Jews as being less than human, as being a threat, as being something that needed to be eradicated. If we look at the Rwandan genocide, uh, the Rwandan radio, uh, Radio Liberty, uh, Mil Kalim, Thousand Hills, instrumental in the Rwandan genocide, perhaps even in a more direct way than Goebbels propaganda machine in that it was actively directing the killers. And similarly, if we look at Islamic State, they have been enormously successful at shaping a narrative, at using public messaging to create the hate, create the, the dehumanizing, othering of a minority, which is a necess necessity for this sort of mass murder. I think to understand the full extent of that, we need to look a little bit at, at Islamic State's roots. And Islamic State's often described as an offshoot of Al-Qaeda or someone that grew, something that grew out of Al-Qaeda, a branch of Al-Qaeda. And that's true, sort of. But it's more nuanced than that, it's more complicated than that. So the so-called Islamic State was the brainchild, the creation of a man named Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, a Jordanian uh, thug at one time. And he was in Afghanistan. He clashed with, uh, excuse me, with Osama bin Laden, the, the, the now deceased leader of al-Qaeda. They didn't get along particularly well. Um, Zarqawi ended up in Iraq during the insurgency against the Americans, and he pledged baya, he pledged an oath, of, an oath of loyalty to bin Laden, but he was separate. Bin Laden and but bin Laden's uh, deputy, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, were in presumably Pakistan at the time. Zarqawi was in Iraq. He had a certain amount of autonomy, and he was kind of his own, his own leader, and he had his own ideas about jihad. And... I think the best way to, to illustrate some of these tensions and some of these differences is for me to read you uh, a 2005 letter from Zawahiri to Zarqawi. Uh, he says, Dear brother, God Almighty knows how much I miss meeting with you, how much I long to join you in your historic battle against the greatest of criminals and apostates in the heart of the Islamic world, the field where epic and major battles in the history of Islam were fought. I th think that if I could find a way to you, I would not delay a day, God willing. Remember, this is Zawahiri, the Al-Qaeda deputy leader, writing to Zarqawi. And you, you can tell there's almost deference in the, in the tone here. But then he, he's perhaps warming up to his criticism. He wants to criticize Zar Zarqawi. Because Zarqawi was, he was engaged in this war against the Shia. So Islam has a variety of sects. Uh, the two main ones are the Sunni Islam, which is uh, the majority uh, of, of, the, of the Islamic faith, the Islamic, uh, Muslim population of the world, and Shia, which is the majority in Iraq. And Zarqawi had uh, targeted the Shias for a number of bombing and, bombings and other atrocities. And he was also beheading hostages on camera at the time. Um, very graphic, very public. And Zarqawi, he criticizes him about this. On the Shia... He says, can we really kill all the Shia in Iraq? Has any Islamic state in history ever attempted this? And he says, can we really justify killing them when their only crime is ignorance? Zarqawi's response would be yes, and we'll get to that. But he also talks about the, this gore, this, this very in-your-face violence. He says, among the things which the feelings of the Muslim populace who love and support you will never find palatable are the scenes of slaughtering the hostages. You shouldn't be deceived by the praise of some of the zealous young men and their description of you as a sheikh of the slaughterers. They do not express the general view of the admirer and the supporter of the, of the resistance in Iraq and of you in particular 
by the favor and blessing of God's. So Zawahiri then, he goes on, he talks about how he had suffered his own losses because of airstrikes, but he says, however, despite all this, I say to you that we are in a battle and more than half of this battle is taking place in the battle of the media and that we are in a media battle for the hearts and minds of the Ummah. So he is recognizing the importance of the media, the propaganda battle, and Zarqawi understood this, and the Islamic State understood this as well. So the Islamic State would eventually split from Al-Qaeda. Again, I'm arguing that they always had a certain difference from each other, but they would eventually split during the Syrian Civil War. But in 2016, they published their own uh, pamphlet. It was entitled, uh, You Are a Mujahid, Media Operative, You Are a Mujahideed Too. And it's direct at, directed at their, their propagandists, their, their, their journalists, their, their tweeters, their snuff film makers. And it's interesting because they quote, Zawahiri's line from a decade before talking about the importance of the media battle. Crucially, they don't say who the author is because they had split with Al-Qaeda. They don't, of course, uh, include his criticism either regarding not, ta not targeting Muslims in their terror campaign, but they do repeat, we are in a battle and more than half of this battle is taking place in the battlefield of the media. So in other words, they had embraced the potential of uh, media messaging, of, of propaganda. But what was different was both the, the volume and the quality of their media and the specific messages that they were trying to get across. Let me talk about volume first. What Islamic State put out, and they put out much less now because they've lost territory, dwarfed. Remember back the early days after 9-11, every couple months you'd have a gravelly audio recording of Osama bin Laden on a cassette tape. Islamic State had hundreds of media products a month, ranging from feature films to, uh, the, the, again, the, the snuff films, the tweeting videos, the long magazine articles, I spent an awful lot of time going through only, and in multiple languages, but even just to look at their output of their propaganda magazines in English. It's tens upon tens of thousands of words, very high production quality photographs, professionally shot, interspersed with the more, the raw, I mean, the, 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 the and it is, they, they have this mix of, 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 of highbrow theology, which we'll get to in a sec, and then the, more, the baser appeal to gore and violence, and that shows up in some of the media as well. Um, but some of the photographs are just, they're, they're so intricately composed and carefully shot early in the morning or late in the evening when the light is soft and they'll focus in on the, the soldier putting the, the cartridges in his magazine or, or, or praying. Um, this is something in which they put an awful lot of effort into. Um, in terms of the messaging, the actual themes, um, there's a couple that emerge. Uh, brutality, as I mentioned, they have long, long religious tracks, but also a, a, a lot more uh, graphic appeals to, to violence and to people that are drawn to violence. And, 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 and we've seen some of this, and, and, and most of us ho hopefully have avoided uh, coming across the worst of it. Um, but you have this, this appeal to religious theology and then you have the, the, much, the much uglier, the much raw uh, gore. Um, mercy is a theme as well. The idea that uh, you can find redemption by joining the Islamic State. Your choices are death or brotherhood. Uh, you can make up for your sins uh, if you join Islamic State. Uh, and brotherhood is another, another theme that comes through in the media, the idea that you can find a home, you can find a comradeship uh, amongst us. Uh, victimhood, uh, 
the idea that Islamic State is, is, is both powerful but also targeted by these uh, much larger array of, of uh, international forces. And also statehood. And this is, this is something we'll talk about a little bit later on. But one of the, the, the splits, one of the key differences, strategic differences between Al-Qaeda and the so-called Islamic State is Bin Laden never wanted to rush declaring an Islamic State because he recognized the danger of declaring a state and then losing territory. Islamic State rejected that. They wanted to, and they did, of course, as we all know, they declared the rebirth of the caliphate or this Islamic State. Their theme was um, uh, persisting and expanding. So having physical territory, being an actual state, was key to their self-conception. And this was, this is something you see in their media as well. Everything from, look, here we are uh, giving uh, welfare services to the poor or the elderly. We are a state. We are functioning as a state. We have caused the rebirth of what has long been uh, aspired to by uh, jihadists, but which we haven't seen since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So those, those are some of the specific uh, messages that come through in the media. But there's two overarching themes, which I think kind of supplant all of that. The first is this. It's an escalation of religious supremacism, referring to wretched Druze or cursed Jews or cursed uh, Rafida, this, this slander, this slur against the Shia Muslims. But it's more than that. It's this idea of a takfir or takfirism. So takfir is the act of declaring someone to be an apostate. And it's a dangerous thing to do because falsely declaring someone to be an apostate is apostasy itself. So according to the most, most uh, severe interpretations of Sharia law, if person A declares person B an apostate, one of them needs to die, because one of them is committed the sin of ap apostasy, either the uh, accuser or the accusee. Islamic State hasn't shied away from this. They have declared the entire Shia sect to be apostates who must die. 200 million people. This is an escalation of eliminationist uh, takfirism, religious supremacism, which recall even Zawahiri wouldn't contemplate. How can we condemn the Shias when they are forgiven because of their ignorance, he said. The second theme, also much more severe, much more important, given much more importance in Islamic State's messaging, is this apocalyptic end times theology. And this exists in Islam, it exists in Shia Islam, it exists in Christianity and Judaism as well, this sort of this messianic uh, themes. I mean, this is not unique to Islam, and it's not unique to Islamic State's conception of Islam. Uh, but it's given... Uh, such a, uh, an exaggerated importance in their theology and in their messaging. Uh, recall, I think I mentioned their propaganda magazine, Dabiq. Dabiq is a small Syrian town. They named their propaganda magazine Dabiq because according to Islamic theology, this is where there's going to be an apocalyptic confrontation between the armies of the infidels and the armies of Islam. So they wanted to take the town when they lost the town, they changed the name of their propaganda magazine to Rome. But um, one of the, Peter Kassig, the American aid worker, former uh, service person, Marine, I believe, um, Islamic State released a video of one of their members, uh, I believe one of their British uh, members, I believe it was so-called Jihadi John, uh, a standing... Uh, with the uh, decapitated body of Kassig and saying, here we are in Dabiq with the first uh, dead crusader waiting for the rest of you. So the idea that there is going to have this, this confrontation uh, between, um, again, the Islamic State and the army of the infidels just permeates their messaging, permeates their theology, 
um, this sort of obsession with this end of times, the apocalypse, the hour, as they call it. Now, what do these, th these two themes specifically have to do with the Yazidis? Well, I'd argue the religious supremacism, this takfirism, once you contemplate, once you embrace the idea of takfirism on this level, that you would endorse the murder of 200 million people, um, eliminating a much smaller minority is not much of a step to take. Uh, and and, and they, they, they talk, let me, let me read you Islamic State in, in their own words. So this is um, this is from October 2014. In, so sh short, shortly after uh, taking over Sinjar, the Yazidi heartland, they published the following article in, in their propaganda magazine. Upon conquering the region of Sinjar in Wilayat Ninawe, so Nino, this is Wilayat is like a subsection of an Islamic state in, in Nineveh is uh, northwestern Iraq. The Islamic state faced a population of Yazidis, a pagan minority existent for ages in regions of Iraq and Sham. Sham is like the Levant. Their continual existence to this day is a matter that Muslims should question as they will be asked about it on Judgment Day. The author's article then says that Islamic law students were tasked with researching the Yazidi religion to determine whether Yazidis were once Muslims who became apostates or if they belonged to an original mushrik religion. This means idolaters or polytheists. And they concluded the latter. They said, quote, Accordingly, the Islamic State dealt with this group as the majority of Islamic jurists have indicated how mushrikin should be dealt with. Unlike the Jews and Christians, there was no room for jizya. This is like a protection payment. Also, their women could be enslaved, unlike female apostates, who the majority of scholars say cannot be enslaved and can only be given an ultimatum to repent or face the sword. Upon capture, the Yazidi women and children were then divided according to the Sharia amongst the fighters of Islamic State who participated in the Sinjar operations. About one-fifth of the slaves were transferred to the Islamic State's authority to be divided as kums. This is tax taken from war spoils. Now, there were people that refused to believe that this was true. It seemed, again, it seemed so medieval. It seemed so beyond... Uh, it was, it was, there were people that said this was propaganda against the Islamic State. And the Islamic State, in fact, addressed those accusations in a subsequent article, which, again, I also would like to, to read to you. This is from a female uh, author in May 2015. And the author is quite upset that, as she put it, she said, some Muslims had tried to defend Islamic State by denying that it, that it had enslaved the Yazidis, that its members were slavers. She said, and I quote, but what really alarmed me was that some of Islamic State supporters, may Allah forgive them, rushed to defend the Islamic State. May its honor persist and may Allah expand its territory. After the Kufr media touched upon the state's capture of the Yazidi women, so the supporters started denying the matter as if the soldiers of the caliphate had committed a mistake or evil. I write this while the letters drip of pride. Yes, O oh religions of kufr, this is religions of unbelief altogether, we have indeed raided and captured the kufr women and drove them like sheep by the edge of the sword. I further increase the spiteful ones by my anger by saying that I and those with me at home prostrated to God in gratitude on the day the first slave girl entered our home. Yes, we thanked our Lord for having us, for letting us live to this day. We saw the kuffar humiliated and its banner destroyed. Here we are today, 
and after centuries reviving a prophetic, prophetic sunnah, this is a tribute to saying, uh, saying a tribute to the prophet, which both the Arab and non-Arab enemies of Allah had buried. By Allah, we brought it back by the edge of the sword, and we did not do, through, do so through pacifism, negotiations, democracy, or elections. We established it according to the prophetic way, with blood-red swords, not with finger-waving, or voting, or tweeting. So there you have this justification, the celebration even of enslavement and of murder based on this extreme religious supremacism. Now remember, this is after the fact. So we cannot say that the ground was prepared directly for the Yazidi genocide, for this enslavement. Because um, again, if you recall back to the first quote that I read you, they talked about discovering or coming upon this Yazidi minority and then convening this, this discussion, this religious discussion about what should uh, be done about them. But again, when you establish this takfirism, this, this, this eliminationist uh, religious supremacism, it is a small step to actually carrying out genocide. That's the first overriding theme, this sort of religious supremacism, this takfirism. The second one, recall, I talked about this apocalyptic obsession with the coming of the end of times. And here's where things get quite interesting. The first article I read, October 2014, where he describes what happens, the author goes into specific and intricate detail finding justification for slavery, for enslavement in Islamic prophecy. He says, in fact, he cites a hadith, this is another saying attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, and there are, I mean, we can get into the hadith later on, there are so many of them, and they're open to many interpretations, and some are given more credence than others, and this has many interpretations, which the author addresses. But he concludes that it is a little, literal interpretation, and it says that one of the signs of the hour, or the end of times, would be when the slave girl gives birth to her master. So here you see this sort of apocalyptic theology being used as a justification for enslavement. The idea, because if a, a, a Yazidi woman is enslaved, her son is born, and the son is an Islam, is, sorry, the son is Muslim, and the son, then the son is the master. The mother has given birth to her master. Um, so it's this combination of both this religious supremacism, this violent eliminationist supremacism, and also this end time theology, which I think we can see how this was applied directly to cultivating support for the genocide, for the enslavement of the Yazidis, and for their mass murder. So how do we respond? What are our responsibilities? What's my responsibility as a journalist? What are our responsibilities as citizens? What should be the responsibility of policymakers? Let me talk about the policymaking first. Um, earlier on I said how Islamic State, the key difference between them, or one of the key differences between them and Al-Qaeda, was this this, uh, the importance they place on holding territory. They are a state. This isn't something that's going to happen sometime in the future. They have declared a caliphate, lasting and expanding. There's been a lot of talk, um, analysts discussing what will become of Islamic states now that they have lost almost all their territory. Will they be more dangerous? Maybe. I don't think they're going away. But I think we need to acknowledge how central being an actual state was to Islamic states 
entire conception of itself and how damaging losing that territory is. So I think countries outside Iraq were entirely correct to expend effort on taking away the physical territory that Islamic State held. Not only to remove Islamic State from the populations that it controlled, to liberate those populations from the atrocities they were suffering, and I'm not avoiding and I'm not, uh, I don't mean to ignore the alternatives, but also because it was such, losing that state is so powerful and is so effect, effective in terms of undermining the entire self-conception, the entire ideology of Islamic State itself. I think that was correct. I think that should be, should remain a focus uh, of the Iraqi government and of its allies or those who see common cause, is to deny Islamic State that physical territory. But what about, as journalists, I think, and this, is, this isn't just for journalists, this is the population, this is all of us. Um, I think we need to recognize when we're being spun. Um, journalists were often, our guard is up when public relations folks are trying to tell us a certain angle when politicians give a very crafted message when they refuse to deviate from that message. Islamic State does the same thing. When they post their snuff films of beheadings, of burnings, yes, they do that, I'm convinced, because they are sadists, because they are cruel, but also because of they believe in the message that that imparts. And let me... Let me quote directly from that media operative booklet. This is recalled, media operative, you are a, you are a holy war, you are a mujahid, mujahideed too. Anyone who knows the crusaders of today and cre keeps track of that which infuriates them understands how they are angered and terrorized by jihadi, mean, by jihadi media they, the curse of God, the Almighty, beyond them, know its importance, impact, and significance more than any others. So, of course, we shouldn't deny, we shouldn't avoid exposing the cruelty in these atrocities. But it doesn't need, mean we need to wallow in it. It doesn't mean we need to rebroadcast, as Fox News did, the video of the Jordanian pilot Kasabe being burned alive. We don't need to show the beheading. Well, no one shows the beheading videos. No responsible media does. I don't even want to see. I don't see the purpose of showing the moment beforehand. I think that is, that is playing into the messaging strategy of the Islamic State. There's another thing I want to talk about, and this applies to the media as well, and, and I hope we can discuss this because I, I suspect it might be a little bit controversial. But I find often, and I understand why, Islamic State has hijacked a religion. And that fact often generates a response that Islamic State, the so-called Islamic State, Daesh, has nothing to do with Islam. I think that's far less nuanced than it needs to be, and I think it's used to shut down a conversation. And most importantly, I think it it denies the importance that Islamic State puts on religion in terms of its own self-conception. To say it has nothing to do with Islam stops us from having the conversation that we need to have. And that conversation, does Islamic State have something to do with Islam? I think that's up to the community of believers. And the vast majority of the community of believers 
says, no, it doesn't. They are not Islam. They're not Muslims. But I think we need to understand how... So let, me, let, me, let me be clear about that. It's up to the community of believers. The vast majority of the community of believers has rejected Islamic State. But to shut down the conversation by saying it has nothing to do with Islam prevents us from confronting and from understanding what I've tried to argue tonight in terms of the importance that Islamic State places on their belief, on their allegation, on their claim to being Islam, Islamic, Muslims. If you spend any amount of time with the propaganda, with the media outputs of Islamic State, yes, there's appeal to victimhood and to disenfranchisement and to the decadence of the West, but there is an awful lot of very detailed arguments based on theology, based on an interpretation, based on what most Muslims would say is a perversion of theology. But we need to understand the centrality of that message to Islamic State's self-conception and to their appeal. And also, and this is, this is nothing new, this is nothing that clerics, Muslim clerics, haven't been doing for years, but the same, we need to confront that and we need to accept that because the same messaging, the same Quranic verses, the same hadith that Islamic State uses to justify everything from the burning of the pilot to enslavement can be used for other purposes as well. There's nothing unique. There's rules for slavery in the Old Testament. There's nothing unique about the Quran, about these hadith that some Islamic State propagandists use, but they can be used for other purposes as well. Let me give you an example that jumped out at me in the issue of Rumiya, or Rome. And they're talk, they're, the, the, the author is decrying this, uh, the, the, this partisanship of the, uh, the state of ignorance before the coming of the advent of Islam. And the author cites a, a verse in the Quran that says in part, we made you peoples and tribes for you to recognize one another. Now, Islamic State is using that to advocate for against this pre-Islamic partisanship and to advocate for unity among Muslims. And of course, the implication is among Sunni Muslims and a narrower, narrower sect of Sunni Muslims at that. But that same text has been used to argue for as an as a, as a Islamic uh, argument in favor of, of pluralism and understanding. Um, so simil similarly, they, they often, a lot of their propaganda harkens back to earlier caliphs. They talk about uh, Harun al-Rashid, this, this very one of the uh, powerful and early caliphs. Well, he was a he was a bon vivant, you know. He liked to party and he liked the the wine and you know he. So the same history that Islamic State uses to justify their interpretation of what the faith should represent, the same Islamic texts can be used for much different purposes. But we can't have that conversation, we can't open ourselves up to that if we shut down a discussion about how Islamic State sees itself and the centrality of theology and of religion to their self-image. So what happens now? What happens next? Well. I've talked about the importance of losing territory. I'm not, certainly not going to solve Islamic State's uh, existence, but I think it is central to uh, undermining its ideology. But what happens with the perpetrators of the genocide, the Yazidi genocide? What happens to the victims of that genocide as well? Um, I don't think there can be reconciliation. I don't think there can be progress. I don't think it's possible to get past a genocide without justice. And by justice, I mean justice for the victims and punishment for the perpetrators. 
But where do we divide, where do we draw the line between justice and reconciliation? Is reconciliation possible? I don't know. I'm reminded of the Yazidis in the Dohuk refugee camp where they talk about looking back as they climbed up Mount Sinjar and seeing their, their Sunni Arab neighbors looting their homes after they've been driven up the mountain. They're going to have to live with those people again. They're going to have to live together again. And it seems to me that some reconciliation is necessary between those people, if not the perpetrators of the genocide itself, if not the killers, if not the rapists, if not the decapitators, if not the Canadians, the Americans, the British, the Tunisians, the French, that travel to Syria, travel to Iraq, knowing full well the organization that they were joining, what it represented, and the crimes that it carried out. Is some sort of reconciliation, is it possible to move, move past? Again, I don't know, and it really seems trite for me to say. I'm, I'm here in Canada. Um, I do take some hope or see some optimism actually in another country, in Afghanistan, which has always meant an awful lot to me where I've done some reporting. Um, I spent a lot of time with a man there uh, named Masood Khalili. He's, a, he's currently the Afghan ambassador to Spain, but before that he was a mujahid, um, he's a, a, a holy warrior against the jihadists, uh, he would say against the uh, occupying Soviets in the 1980s. When I visited him at one of his summer homes outside Kabul, he, uh, he would point, he would say, look, you know, see that mountain over there? That's, that's where Alexander the Great kept his, had a, had a camp. And over there is where we used to climb out of Afghanistan into Pakistan to get rocket launchers from the CIA. Um, but in 2001, after all that, he was back in northern Afghanistan actually in the same village where I ended up a couple weeks later. And if you recall, on September 9th, 2001, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, assassinated the Northern uh, Alliance leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was the best friend of Massoud Khalili. And Massoud Khalili, was, his eye and his lungs were full of shrapnel. And he woke up days later in Dushanbe, and he... Uh, what happened to him was explained to him, and he calls his son and he says, um, if there's a war, uh, I understand that you might want to fight, but don't seek revenge on my behalf. I've already forgiven the boys that have done this to me. And later on, uh, when I was in his house, um, he had painted, the, his, his wife is, a, is an artist, and she had painted the walls with uh, calligraphy of these poems by uh, uh, Jalal Adin Muhammad Balki. And Khalili had this uh, singing bell. It's, it's something that he had, he had received from, from India when he was a, he was a, a diplomat there because India was supporting the Northern Alliance in their fight against the Taliban. And uh, you, run, you, you run a mallet around the top, and it, it sings. And he started reciting poetry from, from Balki. And the one that he, that he picked was, you may have heard it, but it, it's, again, it, it's, it's, it's this call to not unity, but a, a tolerance. It's come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, fire worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Come, even though you have broken your vows a thousand times. Come, yet again. Come, come. It's similar, I guess, to that Quranic, vo that Quranic verse. It, it's it's a, a celebration of the possibility of a pluralism, of a reconciliation, of a tolerance. And Afghanistan's got a lot of trouble as well, but I spent enough time uh, with people that have every reason uh, not to forgive, uh, that have. 
And again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for a second um, blanket forgiveness, certainly not forgetting. I think that there are, uh, there are slavers, there are murderers that I think need to, need to see justice. But I also think that somewhere in the story as it unfolds in the years ahead, there's going to have to be uh, a role for forgiveness as well. Thank you very much. So we're not gonna let Michael off the hook now. I'm gonna invite John Young back up to the stage. Um, so we're going to give them a little bit of time for some in conversation, uh, and then I'll come back up to the stage. We'll have some roaming microphones, and then we'll take some questions from the crowd. Uh, but we'll start with an opportunity for John to have a bit of a conversation with Michael. Thanks, Angela. And Michael, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the experiences you've, you've gone through over the last I think 18 years was the first time you went to, 18 years ago was the first time you went to Afghanistan and you, you recounted in your, in your book, uh, Is This Your First War? Um, I want to just back up a little bit and kind of reference some of that autobiographical uh, material that you cover and then we can move forward to some of the points that you've discussed here. Um, you started off backpacking <laughs> through the area uh, before 2001, and then as a, as a journalistic intern, because of that experience, you had an opportunity to, to go as a journalist in the aftermath of uh, uh, 2000, uh, September 11th, uh, yeah. 2001. And uh, in your book, you recount some of those Afghan uh, experiences in Afghanistan, and then you move through Darfur and Palestine and... Uh, back to Afghanistan, and then since, since the book came out, you've been in Iraq and Lebanon and Egypt. Um, what is it that has you hooked on the Middle East? What has drawn you there uh, so many times? And um, how has that part of the world become such a fundamental part of your life? I think like a lot of things in life, it started out with a little bit of a little bit of fluke, I mean, I had I backpacked. I was fascinated, I guess, as a young man with the the Silk Road, and in by 2000, the Chinese and the Pakistanis. Some, several years before, they had uh, they had opened up a highway connecting China and Pakistan, which kind of made possible this old kind of trade route. So in 2000, a friend of mine and I we we, we traveled through there and. It was an enormously enriching experience. Um, we went south, not really knowing a whole lot about the region, but I was very fulfilled because I, I, I had this, this historical fascination with the Silk Road, with some of the, as an historian, with some of the uh, confrontations between the, the British and the Russian Empire in the same area of Central Asia during the Great Game, even by Alexander the Great. So I just had all these historical buttons that were being pushed. So we went south into, into Pakistan, and then we... We, we took a little diversion to the tribal areas of Pakistan. Um, we went up the Khyber Pass, where so many armies have gone, gone before, and uh, spent some time on the border, and uh, it was quite exciting for a 25, 26-year-old. But then the following year, on September 11th, um, this will sound ridiculous, but it's true, uh, my editor essentially said, well, no one really knows much about Afghanistan, but you've seen it. <laughs> you go. Um, so I went to Afghanistan in, in the fall of 2001, and I think it was a combination of being, uh, being a, a, a young man, um, being exposed to uh, many things for the first time, certainly the suffering of... of of, of refugees, um, of, of combat, being under, being under fire, of, of losing colleagues. Um, it just was a very, a very, 
I don't want to say scarring, although it, that, that would be true as well. But all those kind of factors just kind of coalesced to really be, be, be a very searing experience. And, uh, and I was hooked. I, I came out of Afghanistan, and I, I, I immediately wanted to go, to go back. And it took a long time to go back, but that itch was always there. But meanwhile, I, it had sort of sucked me into the region um, uh, as, as a whole. And I just, I mean, there's many things I, I like about it. Um, there are many, one shouldn't stereotype, of course, but there are many uh, things I enjoy about the people that live in these regions um, and spending time with them. Um, as a journalist, I very much, I like to, even as an historian, I mean, my, my, my book about the Spanish Civil War was about young, not always young, but people that had gone to fight in the Spanish Civil War in, 30, in the 1930s that had been largely overlooked. Um, and there are a lot of people who are overlooked or whose stories are not told in the, uh, in the Middle East and Central Asia as well. So all those factors kind of coalesced. It, it was a very attractive place as a journalist. It was a very stimulating um, uh, place to be. And it had that, just that, again, that foundational searing of, of being on my 2001 Afghanistan experience. And all those things, I think, kind of contributed to, to, to pulling me back after that. So how does your experience in Iraq, and particularly with the Yazidis, uh, fit into the overall narrative of your many other experiences throughout the Middle East? Is it, is it one of rupture or continuity with other experiences? Look, I mean, I think one could argue convincingly, and I, I probably have, that the Hazaras in Afghanistan suffered genocide at the hands of the Taliban in the, in the 1990s. Um, but I think, I think what happened and what, what's happening to the Yazidis is, is, is still something not entirely unique, but very unique. Um, again, it was, if we accept genocide as an attempt to eliminate in whole or in part uh, an identifiable group, uh, that happened. Um, it happened even despite, I've lost track of how many times we've said never again. Um, that sort of mass enslavement. And even in Islamic State's own propaganda, they do talk about when they're celebrating uh, the, the enslavement of the Yazidis, um, they celebrate it specifically because it is something new, it is something revived. And I think the author in the, in the October 2014 article I think he has, has, makes a grudging kind of passing nod um, to, uh, to Nigeria and to, and to the enslavement of, of some of the women there. But they're still saying that this is something new, this is, this is, this is new ground. So, so I would say it, it was uh, a rupture, and not just for me, I think for, for a lot of us. It, it was and it, it, it is something, again, not entirely new, but something significantly different than than all, many of the other mass atrocities that, that we've seen in the last, the last decades. Perhaps one of the uh, more provocative elements of your presentation tonight was um, highlighting the theological roots of ISIS propaganda, that apocalyptic, utopian approach, yes, but also the efforts to justify uh, horrors uh, drawing from religious doctrine, legitimately or not. Uh, at risk of oversimplification, um, it seems that there's sometimes two different, very rival interpretations of ISIS that circulate, and you mentioned them in your presentation. The first, that ISIS has nothing whatsoever to do with Islam, and the second that sometimes circulates is that uh, ISIS is very much a manifestation of Islamism. You've suggested something, at least somewhere in between uh, those, that oversimplified dichotomy. How is that position received and uh, how can the role of religion be acknowledged without leaving the impression that religion is inherently violent? Yeah. Um. I mean, I think as everyone probably assumes, I'm, I'm not a theologian of, of, of Islam or of any faith, so I'm, 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 there's a limit to what I, what I can say. Um, but I, 
My argument is that theology and theological justification for almost everything they do is so central to Islamic State self-conception that to deny that or to not probe that is condemns us to not understanding the group at all. To say the group is motivated only by, and that, that opens up to other uh, fallacious interpretations that the group is anti-colonial. They're not anti-colonial, they're colonialists, if anything. Uh, that the group is anti-colonial or they are aggrieved by uh, the, the terrible living conditions in the, in the ban banlieue of, of Paris. Yes, that draws people, but when someone makes a claim about why they do something, I'm, I tend to believe them. And again and again and again, and in intrinsic detail and in overwhelming volume, Islamic State draws on their interpretations of Islamic texts. So I think we need to take them at their word that this is central to their self-identity -ident and also is a central element, not the only element, of their recruiting appeal. But again, I think, to go back a little bit to my talk, they're drawing from, and Islam may be a little bit unique in this sense, not just the Quran, but the number of hadith, these sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, you know, takes lifetimes to, to absorb. Excuse me, so there's an enormous, uh, amount of, of potential justifying texts that one could draw on. Uh, many of those texts are open to interpretations, as are all faith texts. I mean, again, there, we, there's, there's slavery in, in the Bible as well. Um, so there's nothing necessarily unique about uh, Islam. Um, it is open to interpretation, uh, but I think we need to acknowledge that uh, Islamic State builds their entire identity based on an interpretation uh, of those texts. So on that note then, um, what you've articulated here is the use of propaganda in the battle for minds and um, whether one uses, uh, as you articulate, snuff films or religious uh, pieces and weaves them together into a way that creates a passion or a hatred. Um, how do we counteract that effectively? I'd like to think that part of our mandate here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is to help um, tell a different <laughs> uh, story, take a different approach, which is to encourage tolerance, respect, um, and appreciation for agency and while we might disagree, we recognize that we have, you know, we, we can live together, uh, we can respect one another even, even on things that we disagree with. How do we, how do we respond to that kind of doctrine, that kind of propaganda elsewhere in the world? What can we as Canadians do and what can we perhaps do better uh, to address those challenges? Yeah. I mean, on the narrow question of the use of religion and propaganda. And one of the things I tried to argue is that some of those same texts can be used uh, to undermine the very message that Islamic State is trying to get, up, get, get across. But I think your broader question, what, what, what we can do, what, or, uh, what people like the community here in the museum can do. Um, I think giving, giving voice to people that have suffered those atrocities, letting People hear their stories. I'm glad Nafia was, was here tonight, and I, I fully predict that in a number of years, as the Yazidi community, for example, as the Yazidi community in Winnipeg uh, grows, um, and as some of the refugees that have settled here, that have escaped the, the genocide, become more settled and become more uh, established members of the community in Winnipeg, um, those voices will be, will be part of the Canadian. Uh, fabric as well, and I think that that's something that we we can only celebrate and, and, and promote. And that again, none of these are uh, solutions. None of these solve everything, but um, I think they're small steps that that build a compassion and build an understanding um, 
amongst people here in Canada, which with small steps uh, can influence uh, the world outside Canada's borders as well. Yeah, I'm going to throw this last question at you as a, as a, as a journalist. Oh. <laughs> Uh, you've written elsewhere, and you mentioned it, uh, some of it here tonight. Uh, you talk about the role of journalism. Um, yeah. You wrote that good journalists ignore sensational aspects of story and exercise skepticism and curiosity. Extensive research, a commitment to finding diverse and legitimate sources, and a desire to inform and serve the public rather than simply, simply capture its attention for a brief moment or two. Given that uh, I think you might be one of the only journalists here tonight, you're speaking. Well, there's a few. No. <laughs> okay. We're going to give, we're, we're give each other the se a secret yeah. handshake. Uh, so, so most of us here today are not journalists, and so here's an opportunity to, to direct this to the public at large. Uh, what would you say to this audience? Uh, what is the public's role in both expecting and perhaps facilitating such journalism? Uh, you have to read it. You have to pay for it, um, and you need to continually demand demand better of us. Um, I'd kind of like to leave it there. Actually, <laughs> okay. um, you know, we're 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 accountable to uh, we're accountable to to our readers and to people that consume what we or our, our listeners or our viewers. And uh, absolutely, you have every right to demand uh, demand a high quality of, of, of journalism, and we have every obligation to, 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 to endeavor our best to provide it. Thanks. With that, I think we should go to questions from the public. So we will have two microphones in the crowd. Chandra over here has one microphone, and Angeliki over there has a microphone. So if you want to signal, one of them will uh, come with the microphone. I see a hand up over here. I will try to see beyond the lights right in the front row here, Angeliki. Um, and we'll just ask you to, as much as possible, um, frame it as a question. We're gonna have about half an hour after the Q&As for more conversation. Michael will be available, uh, but so we can get through as many questions as possible. Um, we're gonna just try to keep them brief as if possible. So in the front here, yes. You have talked about the theology and the propaganda basis of ISIS. That means there has to be an organization, organizational basis for the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. Now, any organization naturally means you have to have a financial backing. And the whole ISIS movement was not created by individual donations here and there. It was big money, a lot of support, state support. You haven't talked about that aspect, and perhaps from your vantage position, you can mention about that, because that is the crux of the whole problem. Mm -hmm. Who are the people who are supporting and making this happen? Mm -hmm. sure. You're referring to uh, allegations that Islamic State refer, re receives funding from Saudi Arabia, from Turkey, from other countries in the, in the Gulf. I, am I inferring correct? And this is the background. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I read the same. Sorry, uh, the gentleman was asking, was saying that, that the funding is more important than the ideology, uh, and was asking what I know about state support for uh, Islamic State. Um, I don't know anything other than, of, of course, some of the rumors and allegations that, that I've read and that you've read as well. Um, I, mean, I think certainly uh, uh, Islamic State gets, has uh, received a lot of revenue from oil that it controlled, and there was trading even with the uh, regime of Bashar al-Assad. Um, in terms of outside funding and where it's coming from, I, I, you're, you're stretching me beyond my expertise. Again, I've, I've read the same reports you have, but I can't, uh, I can't make a, an intelligent, and I'm not trying to avoid the question or cover it up. I just don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, read this, I read the same reports that you do. Um, 
concerning allegations of, of funding generally. The, just, the allegations are often that there, there's been funding from uh, usually countries in the Gulf. Uh, there's allegations that uh, uh, funding from uh, Turkey or that Turkey would turn a blind eye or facilitate the uh, transit of recruits uh, into Syria and Iraq. Uh, I just don't have the expertise to, to, to uh, debunk or, or confirm any of that. I'm sorry. Angeliki, I see two hands at the very back. Um, so first of all, thank you very much um, for, for this event. Um, I wear two hats, that of being a journalist as well as being an academic. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing in this case. Um, when I, when I was hearing you, you speak, um, it reminded me a lot of Martin Bell, um, former BBC journalist who came up with the concept of, of journalism of attachment. And that when you are, as a journalist, um, not on the side of, of the victims, that you're actually acquiescing um, and perhaps even perpetuating the human rights violations that are taking place. Now he got a lot of flack about this. Um, he wrote it in the height of, of the war in Yugoslavia. Um, and uh, he was seen as a traitor by, by a lot of um, established journalists. I, I do tend to, to agree with him, um, but I also think that we have to be really careful about the, the context of how our journalism or our stories or our academic work is being misused, is being used and misused. So the, the, what you were saying in terms of ISIS not having uh, a basis in Islam, and then you did give a very good and, and uh, nuanced argument about the self-perception, though, and the self-perpetuation uh, um, that ISIS has. I want us to also be very careful about the environment in which we make arguments, where, um, and that's the environment of extremism, and the environment of extremism in terms of Islamophobia, in terms of nationalism. So how are our stories as journalists as people who have a platform, how are our stories being heard and how are they also being used or misused with other people um, and, and, and states who have different agendas? Mm -hmm. The second part of that question, I promise it's a good question, um, is, is the, the struggle that we often have um, as storytellers, again, with a platform and, and, and I'm not saying that in a, deri in a derivative manner, in a, mm -hmm. a dismissive manner, that, that's what good journalism is, about the role of victims and victimhood. And often being able to portray a, a, a good story and a good story of victimhood also strips those people of agency. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you balance that? Yeah, okay. I'm going to answer your second question first because I think I agree with you on your second question and I think I mostly agree with you on your second and mostly disagree with you on your first. Uh, so let me get the good, I'll do the good news first. Um, no, your, your point about uh, taking away the agency of victims, absolutely, yes. Um, uh, and I think there's been some very good efforts to uh, empower people directly and journalists will always say, and I said it, and it's true that we want to give a voice to people that don't often have a voice. That's absolutely true. Um, but there are, way, there are ways to do that beyond simply interviewing them and leaving. Uh, some of the really compelling journalism that I've seen um, surrounding the Syrian refugee crisis, for example, involved uh, giving cameras uh, to Syrian refugees, and they would record their own journey, and they would tell their own story, and that is a, a much more literal uh, 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 empowerment and, and, and frankly really powerful journalism as well. Um, I think it's very easy, because again, I mean, as, you're right. Uh, I think the criticism is, is, is implicit in your question is correct. Um, you know, there's that old, uh, apocryphal probably story, although I actually know it's probably true, of um, uh, journalists showing up uh, at a refugee camp in Yugoslavia and saying, all right, who here has been raped that speaks English? Um, 
that kind of cynical exploitation, I mean, yes, it happens. And, and, and yes, I think some Yazidis were as brave and uh, shockingly brave and forthright as they were, and as much as I commend them for telling their stories, um, it can only, I can only imagine that it hurts to tell those stories, and I, I think that as journalists we need to be conscious, conscious, conscious of, of that and uh, uh, the pain we might be causing and the, the exploiting that we might be doing by, by focusing in on some of the more um, sordid uh, details of, of the atrocities visited on the Yazidis, for example. I'm thinking of going to refugee camps and interviewing rape victims. So I, I didn't do that. I didn't ask to do that. I felt, as a man, and for a variety of reasons, I wasn't there long enough. And I mean, there's lots of reasons why I didn't do that. There's been some very, I think, sensitive journalism that did do that. I just, but we do need to be sensitive about that. So again, I think I'm, I think I'm with you there. The first uh, part of your question, I mean, I do agree with you, and the BBC journalist, I think, that you quoted, I don't think there's, anything, there any, there's any such thing as objective journalism. Uh, we don't have an obligation to be objective. We have an obligation to be truthful and to be honest. And there, 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 there are different things. Um, but part of being truthful still means seeking out a variety and a diversity of sources, of perspectives, of angles. And where I think I disagree with you, although I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, I'm not comfortable with journalists massaging the truth of the story they're telling because they're uncomfortable about with who's going to use it. Um, I, I just, that's a dangerous and slippery slope and it's, it's, it's dishonest, I think. And I think the first, I mean, if, if the first rule of doctors is do no harm, the first uh, rule for journalists is tell the truth. And if you're twisting that truth because you don't want to give comfort to people you don't like or you don't want to advance a policy that you disagree with, I, I, I think you're violating uh, or at least infringing on that, on that principle. So I just want to make sure that we have the time so I see Angeliki there and then Chandra at the back of the room, there are two hands. So that would be one, two, and three. And then one up here and then I think that might be wrapping up for our last four questions. Hi. Um, could you tell us some similarities you, you see, you wrote the book on the Spanish Civil War and the young men, maybe a few women who went over there and fought uh, Franco, and the young men and a few women who went over and fought for ISIS. Is yeah. there any similarities in the type of person, uh, psychological makeup? What would compel a person to leave his rather comfortable home in Canada, the States, Europe, and go overseas and fight? Yeah, really good question. I'll try to be quick, because there's other ones. I don't know if I can answer it quickly. Maybe we can chat afterwards. I've actually thought about it a lot. I, I, don't, I haven't come to conclusions. I mean, I think they were, in both cases, they're moti you know, motivated by uh, uh, a, a cause, I would say a very different cause. I think the recruits for ISIS are, are fascists, and the recruits in Spain were fighting against fascism. Um, one of the interesting things I did find uh, is the response of the authorities. Um, there was, uh, the RCMP were quite frightened that the young Canadians who went to fight in Spain, uh, most of whom were communists, were going to get uh, revolutionary experience in Spain and come back and apply that to uh, revolution in Canada. Um, there was also the same, and that's similar, of course, to the fear here with ISIS. Uh, and there was the same um, uh, attitude among certainly one the RCMP commissioner that was saying, you know, so in the in 1930s, a lot of Canadians, 1,500 Canadians went to fight in Spain against Franco and Hitler and Mussolini. Most of them were leftists, most of them were communists, not particularly dedicated communists. The RCMP didn't like them. Uh, and there's some revealing quotes where the RCMP commissioner says, you know, we're, uh, we probably should enforce the law and prevent these guys from leaving. On the other hand, it'd be kind of nice to get rid of them. Um, anyway, it's, it's a big question, but let, let's chat afterwards. Just I, I, think, I think it's too big. At the very back of the room. Um, so you were saying how ISIS bases their roots and operations off of 
Islamic teachings to an extent, um, so there has to be some connection with the religion, but then you said that majority of the Muslim population publicly denounce ISIS and disregard them as true believers of the Islamic religion. So my question to you is, as non-believers, do we have a say as to whether ISIS has religious roots or not? I should be clear that I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Will McCants, who, who's spent a, an academic career in, in Islamic theology. And I just, I thought he was right. He, 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 he said that, again, the, whether they're Muslims or not is up to the community of believers. I just, I'm not, not being a, the, a theologian, I'm not comfortable making that, making that claim. My only claim, my only assertion is that to understand what Islamic State stands for, we need to recognize the centrality of religion to that. Um, your question about as, as non yeah, yes, 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 you or yes, we or yes, non-believers do have uh, a right to be part of that debate. Again, to say, well, you can't be part of this debate, as some people have said, because you're not Muslims. Again, that's just, that's a, that's, that's a, 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 a I, I would argue, um, uh, a cheap tactic to shut down discussion. Um, yes, I, I, I think that non-Muslims should discuss the role of theology in Islamic State, and I think Muslims should discuss the role of uh, Christianity in, in the basis of, 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 of Christian politicians. I, I'm not at all in favor of um, shutting people out of, uh, out of discussions based on their um, religious identity. So we're going to go over here, and then we had a last question in the front. Angela, thank you. Hello, thank you for your wonderful presentation. You spoke about the role of propaganda in creating and building hatred in populations. And I was wondering if you could speak to the importance of education in, in building this layer of hatred and how education could possibly be used to counter the hatred that this propaganda has been, um, has been creating. I know that in one of Nafia's previous presentations, she talked about the education that they received in these um, in these refugee camps that perpetrated hatred of populations and dehumanization. Thank you. Yeah. Um. I, mean, I mean, yes, I, absolutely, I think education has a role. Um, and I, I tried to talk a little bit in my, in my discussion how a fuller, uh, appreciation or fuller understanding of some of these Islamic texts, uh, a more rounded understanding of Islamic history and, um, you know, the predilections and, and, and in, in, indulgences of Harun al-Rashid, the earlier caliph, uh, how that would implicitly or automatically um, undermine some of Islamic states uh, messaging. So, I mean, yes, of course, education is important, but uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of leading jihadists have been very educated people. I mean, Zawahiri was a, an eye doctor, um, for example. Um, so, it's not always it's not always a solution. And the other, I mean, as, as important as I think that, again, not not for me, but as, as Certainly, um, you know, Muslim clerics have, have, have used a much, a very much deeper understanding of Islam to undermine Islamic State's message. Um, absolutely, that's important. But a lot of, if we're looking at Islamic State recruits in the West, this is very different in, you know, in, in Iraq or in Syria and even in, you know, Tunisia or the, the broader Islamic world. But a lot of the, um, a lot of the radicalization, ha or almost all the radicalization, help happens. Uh, outside of mosques, outside of religious institutions. Um, it happens, it's a self-radicalization online, it's, it's these kind of, kind of nodes of, uh, of recruits that radicalize each other. So, I mean, it's important for the broader population as some of the, you know, in, inculcating some of these values and, and, you know, educating about the fullness of religion and, and, and the possibilities of champion, championing uh, uh, compassion and pluralism is. I think that's important for the broader good of society. Um, but a lot of people that are headed to, say, joining the Islamic State, again, at least in the West, um, are operating outside those institutions anyway. So it, it might be a little bit uh, limited. Good, but limited. Uh, same thing with a lot of the 
I mean, they're, they're all very admirable, a lot of these, you know, cross-cultural cross uh, events and, and exchanges. I mean, they're wonderful, wonderful things, but I, I, I don't think that they um, are going to prevent, you know, a bunch of friends in Calgary from heading off to Turkey and trying to cross over into Syria, unfortunately. Okay, my name is Abdul El Tassi. I'm from Winnipeg. I've been here for 48 years. I come from Lebanon. I'm a Sunni. I just wanted to uh, touch base on a couple of things you made. I would have liked to see you made a, 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 a distinction between Islam and ISIS. And that was not clearly made. I would like that uh, explanation. I, as you know, there's Islamophobia in the Western world and there in, in many parts of the world. I just wanted to also mention about slavery. Islam doesn't have a slavery. Uh, the first slave was freed by Abu Bakr Khalifa after the Prophet Muhammad, peace on him. And he said, When did you make people slave and they were born by their mother free? So there's no slavery in Islam after the, the uh, birth of, of, of Islam by Prophet Muhammad. You mentioned a couple of times, I'm not criticizing you, I'm just mentioning, you said a couple of times, the Sunni looted the Yazidi places. Uh, Islam said they lived, the Sunni and the Yazidi lived for many, many years. There's the Sunni, there's the Yazidi here. I'm a Sunni, I helped the Yazidi when they came, when the sixth family was here. and. When they looted the Yazidi, you mentioned it a couple of times in there, I don't think they looted the place because they hated the Yazidi. They lived with them in Syria, in Iraq, in, uh, in, in Turkey, everywhere. I mean, the Islam said, lahum dinukum wa lakum deen. You have your religion and I have mine. I respect you and you respect me. And we build the bridges in here. I'm one of those people from the Sunni who started by with the Jewish community to build bridges between people in here. I would have liked to you separate ISIS from Islam. They are not Muslims. They destroyed mosques 800 years old, as you know. Mm -hmm. And they destroyed a lot of places for the Sunni. The, the, and, 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 and they are not, we do not count them as a Muslim. They call them Islamic State. They're not an Islam. They have nothing to do with Islam. Islam, peace. Islam is not war. And in Islam said, who saves one life like saving the entire humanity and who kills one life like killing the entire humanity. That's the belief of the true Muslim, the true Islam, and this is the teaching. ISIS don't have that. ISIS is a killers. ISIS are murderers. ISIS, they never had anything to do with Islam. This is my, my what I like to talk about and say. What you said, I'm, I'm very pleased with, with all what you mentioned. But this topic needs a long, long night. And not one night, many <laughs> nights in there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, OK, I mean, you said a lot. I, I think your point about to save one life is to save all of humanity, which is also in the Torah. The Torah, is it not as well? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, and this, I mean, this goes to my earlier point about um, that the same, the same sources, the Quran, the Hadith, uh, that Islamic State uses to to justify the most horrendous of crimes can be used against Islamic State as well. I absolutely agree with you. Um, I do actually. I, I, I mean, I, I disagree with some of the things you said, but I, I do. You did. I'm glad you you spoke because. Uh, what I didn't say and what I should have said, and I, I think this, this speaks to your point about Sunni Muslims, and I should have been clear about this, Islamic State has killed hundreds and hundreds of Sunni Muslims as well. Uh, and and I, I should have been clear about that. I mean, yes, uh, they, they have uh, focused uh, enormous uh, violence on, on Shias, uh, but entire families, Sunni families and tribes, uh, have been wiped out as well. Um, so, so again, I, 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 sh I, I, I hope I didn't uh, conflate uh, uh, Sunni Islam and, and, and Islamic State. Um, 
some of your other points might might call for a, a, a longer night, so I'm going to uh, uh, respectfully uh, uh, maybe end my, end my response there. I think that'll bring the end to our question and answer session. So thank you very much, Michael and John. I'll ask you, we're going to move to the next stage, so if you want to get off the stage now, and grab a drink of water, because uh, Michael, I'm going to ask you to head to the back of the room uh, with some books so that people can come and meet you there. Um, and I think this brings the end uh, for our program. Uh, but I'd just like to pick up on that message around building bridges. I think that these conversations are important. I think the reason the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is in Winnipeg is because we can have these important conversations, we can reveal this truth, we can have these difficult discussions, and we can find strategies to be able to work together and find ways. So thank you all for your questions. Uh, thank you all for the conversation. And we hope, um, though we won't continue it late into tonight, that this is just the beginning of these conversations. So Michael will stay behind to sign copies of his book. They're available at the back of the room. And if you don't have a copy of the book with you, it is available for uh, purchase. Um, and I just want to make one little announcement. As we said, this is the President's Lecture Series. Uh, we do have um, our next lecture selected. Um, it is John Burroughs, who is the Canadian Research Chair in Indigenous Law in the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria. So stay tuned on the museum's website for the dates, and those tickets will be available soon. So thank you again. Uh, for sharing your story today and bringing your voice. Uh, thank you to everyone who helped collaborate. Uh, thank you to our ASL interpreters uh, for uh, being here with us this evening. Uh, thank you to Michael and thank you to John. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And as I said, we're not going to rush you out of here right away to your cold cars. Um, we will still uh, be able to use the space for about 20 minutes or so. So please keep the conversation going. And we hope to see you again. Merci beaucoup.